the science of thermodynamics gives us a very good way of looking at things for two reasons. As I was saying before, one reason is that it's absolutely fundamental. And the other reason is that it doesn't it doesn't decomplexify things, it doesn't collapse them or oversimplify them. Which almost all other ways of looking at things do oversimplify the picture. And the reason thermodynamics doesn't have this property of oversimplifying and they're leaving out the bits that don't agree with our model, which when we think about it, has to be how models work or theories work. There's no other way for them to work. We have a very simplified way of looking at the world and we act as if the world matches it or corresponds to it and we ignore those parts of the universe that don't actually match our theory. It might be wondered why this should be so if we could have a really good theory, a really good model, kind of like a super duper model, then maybe it would explain everything and there would be no bits, no stuff that we need to ignore because it doesn't fit in. And it's the case that we do tend to have that assumption that it is possible to get a model that's good enough to model everything. Even some physicists would go along with that. And that's the type of physicist who are interested in the so-called TOW, the theory of everything, which is a funny idea. How can you have a theory of everything? A theory only gets to be a theory because it's logical. Logic only gets to be logic because it excludes. In other words, logic is made up of rules. And we all, we all understand rules. We don't normally look at rules as saying, well, a rule, a rule is that which excludes possibilities. But of course it is. If I say this is to happen, that means no other things must happen, no other outcomes can happen. Rules operate by excluding. There's no such thing as a rule that doesn't exclude. If we did have a rule that didn't exclude, it would be like me saying to you, okay, here's the rule, I want you to do this, and then adding as a proviso, but if you want to do anything else at all, anything under the sun, that's also okay. That's a good thing to say. That's a nice thing to say. Why wouldn't it be? But it sure as hell ain't a rule because it doesn't specify anything. It leaves it wide open. <clears throat> There's no such thing as a rule that leaves everything wide open. There can't be because we have to write down a rule. Or even if we don't write it down, we have to make it up in our head. We have to think it. We have to visualise it. And the only way a rule or a model gets to be something that can be visualized or written down is because they are a lot of things that it isn't. So there's an awful lot of stuff that's excluded. So that gives us this kind of a shell or a skeleton or <clears throat> a definite structure. If I'm going to write down a rule, I have to say what that rule is about, after all. I can't just have a rule, but it's not about anything in particular. Obviously, that would be a bit of a joke and that wouldn't work. So if I'm writing a rule, that's the same thing as writing down something specific. Everything specific gets to be specific by excluding. If you try to have something specific without excluding, you won't have anything specific specific. What you'll have instead is something non-specific. You'll have whatever comes along. You don't even know what's going to come along. 
and that's okay and that's fine that's a kind of a party where everyone's invited but it isn't a rule so when we have a theory that theory in order to be a theory has to exclude i.e there has to be stuff which isn't it so which is we're going to act as if it isn't there and yet on the other hand everything if we have a theory that explains everything we can't explain everything because everything is wide open you can't specify wide open so the only way around that no matter how bright you might be no matter how no matter what type of enormous brain you might have you can't get around that the only way you can get around that little argument is to say well everything isn't actually everything it's a it, it, it is it's a specific set of affairs it's a limited state of affairs it's only this that we can specify nothing else and we could say that and we can say that's why our theory of everything works because everything isn't really everything it's just everything is a, a state of affairs where certain things have been excluded we could argue that, but if we do argue it, it um, we, we kind of make a, we we're making fools of ourselves. We're making we're making a show of ourselves because that's just such obvious obvious nonsense. Trying to argue that everything is limited. Why would it be? Limitations come from the thinking mind because it's thinking mind is logic and logic imposes limitations and that's fair enough that's because it's that's how it works but to get over excited and somehow imagine that reality itself also has this property of being limited just because the thinking mind does is too preposterous even to um spend any more time talking about so i won't we'll put that subject that topic firmly behind us now not waste any more time talking about it So the reason thermodynamics doesn't do what all models do, I oversimplify reality without admitting that an oversimplification, which is to say an information loss is occurring, is because thermodynamics contains two things. It contains the movement towards equilibrium and it also acknowledges the movement away from equilibrium. The movement towards equilibrium is a movement towards definition. It is a movement towards oversimplification. So that is the whole oversimplification process right there. The movement towards e the equilibrium state is something that we can talk about because we know what the equilibrium state is and we know where things are going and we know they're going to go there. And as Ilya Prig Prigonin said, the, um, the father of complexity theory. I think he was the father of complexity theory. He said, when you're talking about this kind of thing, <clears throat> it isn't where you came from that matters, it's where you're going. So that's like saying you could be um, some kind of um, religious zealot, a Jehovah's Witness or something. So your job is, we shall say, and that, that is, this is actually true, because it is the job of a, a religious zealot, is to convert everyone to your way of thinking. So that's the equilibrium state. We know where everything's going. So let's say that you are a religious zealot, a practicing religious zealot. Everyone you meet is gonna have lots of different ideas lots of different um, religious backgrounds maybe you could be meeting muslims and jews and hindus and buddhists and zoroastrians and protestants animists um, sufis whatever you could be meeting an awful lot of different but you don't care i mean you really 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 are not interested in their way of looking at reality you couldn't give a damn 
Now, the only reason you do have some kind of um, what you could call um, very superficial interest is you need to have a superficial interest in where they came from in order to disprove it and argue against it and bring them into the fold and convert them to your way of thinking. So you need to know a tiny bit, but just as much as it takes. It's not as if you're interested in other ways of looking at the world, because I can absolutely assure you, and of course this is true, that um, no religious zealot worthy of the title is interested in other ways of looking at the world. Absolutely they are not. That's the whole point right there. So they're not interested in other ways of looking at the world. They're interested in one thing and one thing only. Beautifully simple. They're interested in converting everyone to their viewpoint. That's that, that's what it's all about. So that if you are this religious cell, that's what I'm trying to say, is that you have no curiosity whatsoever about the bigger picture, about all the diversity. You're only interested in getting all these people that you meet and getting them to see things <clears throat> the same way you do, which is what is meant by this little um, this little motto. It's not where you come from that matters, it's where you're going. And that little um, saying explains equilibrium seeking movement to perfection. Thermodynamics is an essential, I don't mean essential in the sense that you have to have it, but essential in the, in the sense that it um, gets to the, the real nitty gritty, the real grist of things. Because when we look around ourselves in the world, we only, only ever see two things. We only, only ever see movement towards equilibrium and movement away. That's it. And out of those two movements, the dominant one is movement towards equilibrium. That's the one we see most of. Any system that is based on regulation rules, it's all about damping down random fluctuations and bringing everything back in line. So all the movements that occur are errors that are being corrected and brought back to equilibrium values. That's how the body works. If the body didn't work to correct errors and bring everything back to the equilibrium value, we would die in less than a tenth of a second, probably. We'd, every, all the systems would go high, haywire. Equilibrium seeking systems are, and they're so fundamental to us that we don't even think about them because we just take it for granted. And we take it for granted also that the alternative, i.e. when things aren't told what to do, or when things are not being controlled, then they go in the direction of what we call chaos, or they just go, <coughs> stuff just goes to pot. Um, if you let things just go whichever way they're going to, in the, with a the human body, and you let any bacteria or pathogens come along that want to, you die. And so we assume this is true across the board. That, in other words, what we assume is that there is only this one meaningful movement, and that is meaning movement towards the goal or the, um, the defined destination. So it's it has been very hard to see that actually the other movement, the movement out of equilibrium, which is not, not the result of control and it's not the result of locking onto a goal, because if it was it would just be the first type of movement, but what it is it's a movement in a direction that we don't know and there's no control acting there at all, there's no mechanical forces. What we've got going on is what Krishnamurti refers to as the mysterious movement that is reality itself. Reality itself is 
not a, operating according to a rule. It's not heading for a known destination. Even, even the thought of how reality could be seen as a, a, a business of excluding everything that isn't defined and just sticking to what is defined the whole time is ridiculous because that's not how we get reality. That's how we get an abstraction. And an abstraction is the, um, the antithesis of reality. It's a thing that's so narrow, it doesn't exist anymore. It's an abstraction. <coughs> it's just like... Um, it's just like a, a label, a description or something like that. It's got no substance in it. <clears throat> so even though <clears throat> the movement out of equilibrium can be seen to be not something that we need in terms of our physical organism, it turns out to be something that is vitally and health, healthy in terms of <clears throat> our in terms of the psyche, in terms of our inner life. And this brings us to two particular contrasting definitions of mental health. The type of definition of mental health that we all take for granted is the definition which says it, it, it's a kind of um, specified modality of functioning, this, all these parameters. And when we come close to the parameters, then we're healthy because we're normal. We're matching whatever's written down to the specifications on a big manual somewhere. We can say, yep, you're, you're within the specifications, you're at the correct parameters, you're healthy. That's what we assume because that's how the body works. Not totally how the body works, but because they are um, chaotic processes that work in the body too and work in the nervous system. But it turns out that if we think this is a recipe for mental health, um, what we get instead is something that isn't mental health at all. It's a kind of a stuck situation of someone who never grows and has a particular way of seeing things and a particular set of values that just stays the same forever. And it doesn't take too much to, to realise that staying the same forever in your outlook and the way you do things and isn't mental health, it's, um, it's, it's, it's when you're afraid to grow, when you don't grow, you become conservative, and when you become afraid of the known, the unknown, when you become afraid of the new. So that that is our default way of understanding mental health. So the other way of understanding mental health is when we transcend the mechanical processes, in other words, as Gurdjieff would say, it's when we stop being a machine. So unless there is this thing where what, where we are transcending the machine self and going beyond what it, it being a machine means, that's mental health. But there can be no recipe or formula or method for telling us how to go beyond the machine because all methods, recipes, pro procedures, etc., etc., are the very bread and butter of machines. So none of that machine stuff can help us to transcend the machine or become something which is much more expansive than and unpredictable and strange than the machine. So in other words, whilst sticking to what's normal might be good as far as blood sugars are concerned, temperatures concerned, oxygen concentration in the blood is concerned, etc., etc. What is the pure, pure um, essence of being well mentally is when we are moving beyond what is normal, because what is normal is death. As you can as we all know, when things get too normal, that is a inner death. We all know that, even if we don't focus on it. As Frank Herbert says, without something new, without there being change, something inside us goes to sleep. 
And that's just another way of saying that we fall back to being the machine. The machine is, is an equivalent term. It means being asleep in, in this same language. And transcending this machine means realizing that one is not a machine, which in the language that you gets used corresponds to waking up. So when I'm in the business of confirming everything I believe, confirming my belief my beliefs in everything and saying my way is the right way and getting aggressive to everything else and considering it like an error, I when I'm like a religious zealot. Though of course it's not only religious zealots who do this. Then I'm a machine who insists on staying a machine. And I'm also a machine that doesn't know themselves to be a machine because I'm asleep. But when I have the realization that this is not me, this machine self is not me at all. And I realize that I am not a machine. I'm not something that can be defined or explained or written down on a sheet of paper. It sounds kind of weird to us because we love to think of identity as being something specific, something solid, something um, firm, because that's what it means to say, to assert, I am, I am this. In other words, we specify who we are with a rule, which means we, who we are supposedly is very, very narrow. We've excluded everything else apart from what we've specified, which is, as I said, how specifications work. So then this process of identifying ourselves and creating a concrete identity for us identity for ourselves is a process of becoming abstract, a process of becoming unreal, a process of hiding from reality. And it's amazing how how um, hung up we are on it and how incredulous on the whole we get when it is suggested that our true nature is not a something that can be defined or specified. Because then we say, well, what the hell are you talking about? If you can't specify it or say what it is, then it's airy-fairy. It's just like, you know, this is like a laughable argument. You can't specify it. And like when people do say that, there's no, there's no arguing with it, really. Because actually it's completely the other way around. You, whatever you can specify is non-existent. And if it's non-existent, how can it be who we are? But there's no there's no arguing the point, really, because when we're looking at the world in that way, we are not going to get it. We're not going to get the idea that the concrete identity is always, always, always limited, rigid, and fundamentally unreal because it's an abstraction. You could spend days walking around picking on people and trying to explain that. But I'd, I don't think with most people you will get very far. You'd have more luck being a religious zealot and trying to convert people to some absurdly narrow point of view by saying this absurdly narrow point of view is true and everything else is heresy or lies or um, Satan is misleading us. And you'd, you'd get some people, if you go, if you become, obviously religious zealots don't do too badly, they, you know, they get results. But if you try and do the opposite and try and take people in the opposite direction or express this idea that who we are is not a definite destination, but actually when it comes right down to it, who we are is this mysterious movement that we can't say anything about at all. Now, if you try to argue that, in all probability, you won't get anywhere at all. People have got time for that type of um, business, really. Okay, thanks for watching.